Put the phone down. <laughs> there was an alien in the kitchenette making bagels and coffee. <laughs> It cannot be from space. It's not possible. I got my people primed and ready to pick me up. Give me the alien! Get your own alien! We got company! I like this song. Stoke the fire. The idea of a Paul, Nick and I were saying, it, it's kind of true, it was a joke. It was, uh, it, was a, it was born out of boredom on the set of Shaun of the Dead, of uh, having to wait for the British weather in May, which is incredibly erratic. It's sunshine and cloud and rain, and like in a cycle. So Naira and Nick and I are sitting off set, you know, sort of bored, and Naira says, can't we... Naira Park, by the way, is our producer, who we've worked with since Spaced. Um, she said to Nick and I, why can't we make something somewhere that's just sunny? So then Simon and I start thinking, oh, well, maybe it's set in a desert in, in America, in Nevada, and then you start thinking, oh, well, maybe Area 51's there, so the guys meet an alien. And we thought, well, it's got to be two British guys. So we kind of went, OK, two British guys, and they're in America, and they find an alien, and they help him get home to his spaceship. I'm sorry. What's your name? But it's Graham Willey. And what's his name? Uh, that's the writer, Clive Gollings. OK, cool. I'm Paul. Paul? I'm in a hell of a pickle, and if you don't help me, I could die on this road tonight. I don't know, we're on quite a tight schedule. I drew a poster for Naira as a joke because we'd had this long day with a picture of Paul, not too dissimilar to how he looks now, finally, seven years later in the film, saying, in America, everyone's an alien. That was the original tagline. And Naira said, why don't we do Paul? You know, it had been around on her pinboard, that poster, for six, seven years. And so Nick and I started writing it in earnest and found that, that the simplicity of that story really lent itself to a great narrative and, and wrote what I think's one of the best scripts we've ever written, you know. Well, they, uh, for me and Nick, it's the only film script we've ever written. So, how was Comic Con? We met Adam Shadowchild. Who the hell is Adam Shadowchild? Oh, he wrote the Venusian Pangenesis. I didn't read that one. Uh, Jenny Starpepper and the Great Brass Hen? No. The Robot's Mistress? No, I like romances. That's kind of a romance. Between a woman and a machine? Uh, yeah. I hear that. <laughs> I went off and did, like, a big draft of the whole thing while Simon was making a film. So, you know, we turned in, like, a 250-page manuscript, which I think was, like, an eight-hour film. And then from that, we kind of just kind of dug at it and picked away at the rubbish and, and you know, I'm hoping we, we found quite a nice film in there somewhere. But, I mean, essentially, it's... Simon and I sit opposite one another. We don't start until we're ready, so that might be an hour, that might be five minutes. It, if we wait, you know, we'll check the internet and have a laugh, and then suddenly one will have an idea and then it will build and... And we have a big monitor on the wall with the keyboard attached to it. So Simon types and I look at the monitor and say, uh, you spelt the wrong and things like that. But no, we, we just sit and we go through line by line. Inevitably, you come to blows a couple of times, you, you have creative arguments. Nick and I very rarely argue in real life because, you know, we're just mates. We have had big Barneys over the years, but they're always resolved very quickly. And we did have a few rows over Paul because it's hard in the creative process to be turned down. So if, if you get, say, three ideas poo-pooed in a row, it starts to feel a bit personal and you, your, your hackles go up. So you say, what about this? No. What about this? No. What about that? No. And then it's like, what? you just don't want me to be in it. And then, so I'm going to say this, and it has to go in. And then you start realising you're playing mind games with each other, which is dangerous. <laughs> it's a miracle! <laughs> We always knew Paul would look like every alien you've ever seen. We had this idea that 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 he had to be very obvious looking. It was almost like a, a it was in the script. He's just what you expect to see. There's a notion in the uh, in the script about um, about him being about us knowing what he looks like because we've been encouraged to believe it. You know, if you're looking for tentacles or multiple eyes, that's that's not what Paul is about, you know, the whole point of Paul looking normal is we talk about subliminal assimilation in the, in the film and it's because Paul has been on Earth for 60 years, the government has slowly drip-fed details of his shape in, 
you know, in things like the X Files and on lunch boxes. And so, if they ever came down, the populace would not be completely terrified by what they saw. There are nods yeah. in it to other science fiction films. Um, the, the notion we came up with that the Paul has been not only advising the government and, and sort of like, you know, um, letting, giving information about repulsive engines and anti-gravity, he's, he's been influencing yeah. popular culture. So like, you know, he's had a hard wire to people like Steven Spielberg and, you know, the ideas from E.T. and Close Encounters came from Paul. And, and we had, we've been able to retroactively rip off every film ever by saying they were all Paul's idea anyway. What have you been doing here all this time? You know, I've been kicking back, man. I've been advising the government. You'd be surprised how much he's influenced popular culture over the last 60 years. Agent Mulder was right. Agent Mulder was my idea. Really? Wow. Yeah! We acted against nothing, and then we acted against two red LEDs for where his eyes would be. We acted with a ball, silver ball, and a grey ball. We acted with lights for eyeline. We acted with a lighting puppet. We acted with an animatronic puppet. Um, and then there was a, a, a kid in a green suit. There was a little actor, Christoph, in a, in a blue suit. Joe Latrulio, the actor who plays O'Reilly, on his knees doing the voice, because Seth couldn't be on set, because you'd, it would be, you'd be hard pushed to get any actor to come on set of, of that status and provide the voice every day. Just be there as like a eye line and a, you know. Joe, who's an amazingly funny guy, offered to play Paul as well as his own part, which meant we had someone who has had comic ability to bounce off, which made it slightly easier. It's a lot of work to, to get him in. I think there were lots of kind of semi, semi-serious stroke flippant meetings before we shot where we said, look, why don't we just say, Five minutes into meeting Paul, hey guys, I can do this, and he he does something, and he becomes just a man for the rest of the shoot, which I think it would have saved us so much money. Oh, oh! oh no! What? Come on, grow up. You guys see my shorts? I how did you do? How did you do that? How did you go invisible? Oh, uh, it's it's a camouflage response. Or well, like Predator. Exactly. Although I can only do it while I'm holding my breath. But you can do it anytime you want. Anytime. <laughs> That's just like him. <laughs> we actually wanted to make it, um, you know, enjoyable for people to watch and give people something to to get their teeth into. So there's a lot about theology in there. You know, we hook up with a, a creationist family, and Paul immediately the very existence of Paul negates. Uh, Kristen Wiig's character's whole belief system and she kind of has a, a weird breakdown. You know, she realises that her whole, her whole life is, is, has been a lie and she, she goes from being a creationist to being like, she realises she can curse and drink and have sex. <laughs> We're being pursued by a very dangerous FBI agent and two slightly less dangerous lackeys played by Bill Hader and Joe Latrullio and Jason Bateman fabulously as Agent Zoyle. Don't leave me! Ruth, why aren't you driving? I told you, it's easy! It's a love letter to Spielberg. I don't really remember going to school very much, but I remember watching Close Encounters, you know, 20 times. And so this, you know, we've tried to... There's a shot with a, sh a shooting star, and Greg has tried to incorporate lots of nice lens flare, and the, the RV looks like a spaceship, you know, the way they've, they've lit the thing. I remember watching Close Encounters of the Third Kind on Christmas Eve on TV. I'd seen it before. Um, I think I was too young to see it at the cinema. It was a little too cerebral for me at the age of eight or six, or whatever it was. Um, but loving it so much. And E.T. was a massive film for me. E.T. took over from Star Wars for a while. It was my favourite ever film, you know, until Return of the Jedi came out and I, I rejoined the Star Wars crowd for 16 years, then left forever. Uh, but it was, um, it's very much a tribute to those films, and, and you see that in it. And it's also, it's a comedy, but there's real jeopardy in it, you know, it's, it's exciting. I watched it the other day, and, and not even with its finished score, and it was, I was surprised at how exciting, how moving it gets towards the end, and how, and not in a Shaun of the Dead way, Shaun gets kind of tragic towards the end. This is just kind of like, it just leaves you the big grin on your face, but there's a lot of jeopardy. <laughs>